where I have nothing, nothing to do, but just walk around, walk around heaven all day. Just imagine that. Amen. We are going to walk around heaven. Yes, yes. All day. And, and life is worth the living.
because he lived. And it's by the grace of God and the work of, that Jesus did on the earth and on the cross that will allow us that privilege of walking around heaven all day. I'm so excited about this day. Amen. The greatest day. Amen. Yes. Greatest miracle since the creation of mankind was this day that God made a way for us to be redeemed back unto him. It's my prayer that at some point in your life you're able to tap into that spiritual place that makes your heart just groan to be reunited with the Father again in that perfect place. We have no idea what that perfect place was like. We came long after man had been separated from God. Yes. But by what the Lord Jesus did on the cross and what this day of observation uh, recognizes when he rose again from the grave. He was, God was in Jesus. And he was reconciling. He was reconciling us back together with him that we could be in that perfect place. But we, we can't be there. We can't be there while we're in these earthen vessels. But I heard Paul say we have this treasure in these earthen vessels. You know, and not that it's of man, but it's of God. We have this treasure in earthen vessels by the Holy Spirit. That, that treasure is we are from God. We are of God. We are from God. And we look keenly and intentionally at that day when we are reunited with him again, face to face. That's a wonderful thing. We honor the Lord today for his goodness and his mercy. We thank God for all of you. Thank God for our first lady being here in her white array. Amen. Thank God for all of our viewers on Facebook and on, on YouTube. If you're not able to be in the house of prayer on today, then uh, we welcome you to our viewing audience. Wherever you are, in North Carolina, and Texas, and in New York, and in Enfield, and in Virginia, in Maryland, amen, California, Tennessee, wherever you are, we welcome you on this the Lord's Day. Every day is the Lord's Day, but this is a very special day that we recognize the greatest, you know, on Christmas we recognize the greatest gift amen. that was given to the world. Because on that day we recognize the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But on this day, Resurrection Sunday, we recognize the greatest miracle since the beginning of mankind because we'll get that opportunity to walk around heaven all day with the Lord. But then Jesus said in John 10, 10, he says, while you're on the earth, he says, I am come that you might have life. And while you're on the earth, that you might have it more abundantly. We want to recognize today how important it is to walk in that victory. The enemy, Satan, and all of his minions and those that he has influenced, the powers and principalities of this world 
Their job is to keep you distracted. I preached a sermon once called um, a distracted salvation. Where we get distracted. Then a few weeks ago I preached on a convenient Christianity. I think that was last week. A convenient Christianity where we don't take our relationship and our responsibility to God, our accountability to God, seriously. It's because we struggle in the flesh. But the Lord does not want you to miss heaven. It's all about that. The Lord does not want you to miss heaven. And the challenge until you develop that relationship with God that keeps your mind trained and your eyes trained on Him to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the presence, in the relationship, and in the work of the Lord. He said, because uh, little do you know, your labor is not in vain, ever, in the Lord. And my heart goes out to them that, does, that do not see how important this day is. And uh, we're praying for you. We're praying for the believer, that the believer will be stronger. We're praying for the Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches all over the world, and especially in America, that they will return unto the Lord, who will have mercy on, on them. He will have mercy on us, and unto our God, who will abundantly pardon. So we honor the Lord on this day. Thank God for our presiding bishop of North Carolina, third jurisdiction, Bishop Patrick Lane Wooden, our national church, and Bishop J. Drew Sheard. And again, this is a day to remember. Yes. I think back in the day, one of the Motown songs from Shalomar, they, they made the song called A Day to Remember. Well, I want you all to know this is a day to remember. And I thank God for the privilege of being his mouthpiece. Man, I've, 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 I've been in the valley low. I've had some days in my life that I wondered at some point how I got over, how I made it over. I don't think that anymore because God told Paul, he said, the things that we see in the earth, the things that we experience in the earth, the things that we see on a on, on a daily basis. God said for the invisible things of him from the beginning of the world, he said they are clearly seen. Oh man, I'm going to get into that today. You look around and I don't care what science and scientists say. You know the miracles of God are unmatchable. Nobody can take credit for the sun rising every day but God. Nobody can take credit for how, for how the earth rotates on its axis, taking us from daytime to night. Then God gives us a nightlight called the moon. Nobody can take credit for that but God. How the universe operates. The universe is not operating through no remote control somewhere. No, it's being orchestrated by God. And so Paul told the church in Rome in Romans 1 and 26, he said, Romans 1 and 20. He said, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that we are without excuse. Too many of the things that take, that, that take place in the universe 
in this world, in our lives, in our environment. Too many things happen for us not to know that there is a divine creator and architect of our lives yes. in the world that we live in. Yes. And the Lord said to us, he said, that being the case, we are without excuse. So we honor the Lord today. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, give me some time today to talk about the risen Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 at verse 1. I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 8. Then I'm going to jump over to Matthew's gospel. The gospel according to the Apostle Matthew, chapter 28 at verse 5. But we want to start with 1 Corinthians, chapter 15 at verse 1. The Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, or Peter, then of the twelve apostles. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. We want to stop at verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. <clears throat> May the Lord have a blessing through the reading of his word. Want to preach this morning from the topic, Jesus is risen and he lives. Jesus is risen. He is risen. Now he will be raised. Not that he did rise, even though he did rise. But he is risen. Present tense. Right now. He is risen. Jesus is risen. And he lives. Preach me now, Father. May I do no harm to your scriptures. But preach that which becometh the sound doctrine in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible declares that Jesus is risen and he lives. In this writing, the book of 1 Corinthians, just a little history because Paul here is, is, is trying to fix some bad theology. The city of Corinth, of course, as you know, it was the commerce mart of Asia and Europe. And that uh, it was covered with ships. From, from, from Corinth, ships went everywhere. 
What had happened in Corinth was that the Romans, they had divided the province. And so uh, um, Asia and Europe, the seafaring vessels that carried merchandise from one continent to the other, Corinth had become the major port city. And Corinth had a navy to protect it. Mm -hmm. Now his navy force provided Corinth with the respect of all the nations because they were not only the top commercial trade center, but they had a wealth of protection to protect it. Mm -hmm. And its population and its wealth, it just increased. The influx of foreigners came into Corinth because it was solid. It had been sanctioned by Rome. Rome had divided Greece into two provinces, Macedonia and Achaia. Macedonia and Achaia. And Corinth was the capital of Achaia. And this was its condition. It was great. It was wealthy. Uh -huh. It had become a place that every, it was a hub for people coming from around the world. So because of that, because of its history, both Rome and Greece were a, where, where they were polytheistic nations. They believed in several gods. They did not believe in the one God, Jehovah. They believed in many gods. And so when Corinth is made the capital, and you got all these people coming in, they bring all of these theologies and idolic gods with them. Because of that, in any great place, any great nation, at some point, the culture, yeah. the population, it starts to implode because you've got so many diversified factions in it that are not of one mind. Are you with me? Amen. So by the time Paul gets there, in all of its splendor, Corinth had relapsed into a place of dissipation and lasciviousness. And what that means, the lifestyle, the culture had began to fade and become marred because they knew not God. And those that did were of a small minority. Paul being fashioned and commissioned by God to go preach the gospel. Paul goes there for the first time in about 52 AD. He's going there. I'm going somewhere with this now. Y'all stay with me because it's going to take us back to the to the to, to the subject of the sermon. As Bishop Wooden say, I'm going somewhere with this now. We find in Acts 18 and 1 that Paul goes to Corinth. He was on his way from Macedonia to Jerusalem. He originally was going to Athens to start a church. He was supposed to meet Paul. He was supposed to meet Silas and Timothy there. But he gets there. They're not there. He stays there a while in Athens. He gets disappointed. Verse later, don't get Disappointed in where we are or where you are. Paul don't see ministry benefit there. So Paul decides he's going to go back to Mas go back to Jerusalem from Macedonia. But he goes to Corinth first. Now he had intended to go, he was alone, he intended to go alone, but when he, he was supposed to remember now, he was supposed to meet Silas and Timothy. They're not there. 
So he says, I'm going on from Macedonia back to Jerusalem. He goes through Corinth. He gets to Corinth expecting to just be by himself. While he's there, he meets Aquila and Priscilla. He decides he's going to, okay, I'm here. Aquila and Priscilla are here. We will just hold up here in Corinth and wait for Silas and Timothy. And so he began to see an opportunity to preach the gospel. All right, now. So he, he starts to launch a church there. And so when he does that, when he arrives, he starts the great work of preaching the gospel to this great society that had begun in social and spiritual decline. They were idol worshippers. They were rich. They had wealth. They, had, they were prosperous. They had fame and fortune. But these are, this is all fool's gold when it comes to the spiritual relationship with the God of the Bible. So they go there and he sets up the church and he goes first to the Jews. That's why he says, for I'm not, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, it's the power of God to the Jew first, then to the Greeks. So he goes there to court, and he begins to preach to the few Jews that are there. They reject it, so he turns to the Greeks. And he establishes, he establishes the church in Corinth. He's there for a while and he leaves. He leaves Priscilla and Aquila there to continue building the, the ministry. And he goes on back to Jerusalem. Ultimately, he winds up in Ephesus. Timothy meets him there. They begin, they form the church. In Ephesus, where we get the book for, of Ephesians from. He's there. And while he's there in Ephesus, he writes this letter. The book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, is actually started out as a letter. He writes to the church in Corinth, to Priscilla, Aquila. He's writing this letter in response to them because they had sent him a letter expressing problems, concerns that they were having in the church in Corinth. The letter had been sent to Paul while he was at Ephesus to consult with him respecting involving the state of the church at Corinth. In addition to this, Paul had heard various reports that there was some disorder going on in the church at Corinth. And this disorder which had been introduced to them, which they had been exposed to, it required Paul's attention and correction. Paul told them he had got some information from the family of Chloe concerning some bad doctrine that had been had crept into the church. And Paul had concerns when he got that letter. So he begins to respond to these conditions in a letter that is later turned, is later put in the Bible as first and second Corinthians. The division that had arisen in the church was because they had Greek and Jewish converts teaching there. Mm -hmm. And this caused a great disturbance. The problem was there was some errant teaching being introduced to this young church. And it got that way because you had Jewish converts, you had a few Sadducees, and you had some Greek folks that was in the church. So now you've got the leadership. They are teaching things in the church that was different from what Paul taught. The main area.
areas of contention that was in there concerned spiritual gifts and the resurrection. You see where I'm going. You see, you had the Sadducees there. The Sadducees had believed that the resurrection had already passed. They did not believe the active role of the Holy Ghost in the life of men still existed because they believed if the rapture had passed, then they knew from the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit departs with the rapture. So he began to teach the people that maybe your living is in vain. Maybe you're getting some, 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 this is how we perceive it. So Paul comes down to address these things. And so he writes this letter, the first uh, letter to the church of Corinth. And he writes it for the main points of contention concerning spiritual gifts. In the resurrection. And he writes at great length in this first letter with them, dealing with the dealing and what he's writing them concerning is this proof of the doctrine and the resurrection. When we look at our text, we find that salvation through Jesus Christ in its purest form is simply this. Y'all walk with me now. Paul said, moreover, brethren, in chapter 15, verse 1, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. I've already preached this wow. to you. The gospel made simple in its purest form is not from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is God's guide to us on how we should live, how we should hope, and what we accept as history. But he said the gospel itself is very simple, y'all. And I've already taught you this. You are living in it. He said, here it is. Here's how you are saved. Verse 2 and 3 is the gospel in its purest, simplest form. It says, by which you also receive, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. If you don't keep God's word, your faith is, 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 is empty. Your future means nothing beyond this earth because the promise of God is by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe it, your faith is in vain. And here it is. He said, you want proof? He's the only proof I got for you is what the Lord showed me. And what I was told and what I was seen. What I have seen. You see, Paul's uh, 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 salvation experience with Jesus was spirit. The other apostles... The other people that lived in Jesus' day, the other people that saw Jesus going to the cross, the other people that saw him hanged on the cross, the other people that saw him put in the grave, the other people that went to the grave on Sunday morning and on the third day and bound the grave empty, they saw it. They were witnesses. Paul said, I saw Jesus. I saw him in his glory on the Damascus road. But everything Paul had a first hand account a first hand account not only did he see Jesus but he had the experience of being around the apostles. He had the experience of being around Mary the mother of Jesus. He had the experience of being around Mary Magdalene. And he said here it is I'm delivering unto you First of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Herein is part of the Christian eternity. The Christian's eternity rests 
in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I am delivering unto you that which I received. Number one, Jesus died. Yes. And he died according to the scriptures. Yes. Yes. He died according to Old Testament prophecy. He died in the manner that the prophets and the prophecies said that he would die. He died and he promised them before he died. You see, the apostles didn't get it. The Sanhedrin didn't get it. He told Pilate and all of them, he said, look, go ahead and kill me. He said, on the third day, I'm going to rebuild this kingdom. I'm going to rebuild this temple. He didn't get it. They're like, how are you going to rebuild this physical structure in three days? So you see, it is possible for you to be in the midst of teaching, of doctrine, of proof, and still not get it. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you some today examples of that. Even in Jesus' day, the apostles didn't get it all. While Jesus was on the earth, Jesus was on his way to be arrested, and they still didn't get it because Peter tried to keep him from getting arrested. Jesus had to explain to them at the Last Supper, I have to go do this thing so that the scriptures will be fulfilled. I'm talking about our eternity on today. Then it says in verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. How? According to the scriptures. Paul said, this is all the document, this is all the proof you need. And they were eyewitnesses. I'm telling you on today, all the proof you need is in the scriptures. And what Paul said in Romans 1 and 20, that all the things God has done in your life, that's all the proof that you need. And that he was buried. And that he rose again on the third day. I'm trying to help somebody here. Jesus is Lord. There's a better day coming. You can live a righteous life. You can violate the rules. You can think you can take the shortcut to glory. You can say, Lord, I'll get right tomorrow. All you want to. But the Bible has said that on the third day, when he rose from the dead, all prophecies and power was confirmed on that day. Jesus is Lord. He confirmed it on the third day. Bible says that when he left, when he came up out of the grave, by the same spirit that's going to bring us out of the grave, he rose with all power yes. in his hand. He had the keys to both hell and death in his hands. The Bible said he led captivity captive. Now the grave is captive to God. Now death is captive to Jesus because he is now the ruler and high priest of all principalities and all power and Paul is reminding them at the church in Corinth, I already taught these things to you but let me expand maybe I need to take this thing a little further I'm going to take it a little further for you Paul said he said now not only did he rise up again on the third day him rising up again was all the proof that they needed in that day. They had the prophecy. They had the Old Testament. They had the books and the law of Moses. They had it in their hand. They knew what the prophets had said. They knew what Joel had said. They knew what Ezekiel and Daniel had said. They knew what Solomon said. And David had said, oh, they had it right there. And when he rose again on the third day, that was the only piece that was missing was that if 
he does not rise again. Our faith, Paul said, was in vain. If you don't believe the preaching, the Lord said, I'm going to save them through the foolishness of preaching. And if you don't accept the preaching, if you don't accept the doctrine, if you don't receive this by faith, then Paul said, then what you have believed is in vain. It gets better and it gets worse. But Paul said in verse 5, he said that after Jesus rose again, he was seen by Peter. Then he was seen by the other 12 apostles. That's recorded in Matthew. It's recorded in the book of Acts. It's recorded in Mark, Luke. It's recorded in there. Not only was he seen by them, but it's recorded, Paul said, I already taught you this. It was reported that after he was seen of the 12, that he was seen of about 500 people at once. This was not a, 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 a Freemasonry type thing. This was not a fraternity sorority type thing where all the initiation is done in private. Everything is being taught and preached is in private. Yes. He says, no, they were seen by everybody. It was a public occurrence of about 500 people. And he said, most of them were still there on the day that Paul began to write. Most of them were still, a lot of them were still living. He said, however, some of them are falling asleep. That was another area of contention because they were concerned about what would happen to them and their loved ones once they die, if Jesus, the promise of salvation, was not clear, then he said there was a problem there. That it needed to be fixed. This should not be something that confuses you coming from these philosophers and theists in Corinth. But you've got the gospel according to Jesus Christ, which is the anchor. And now that he is risen again, all of your fear should be gone. Paul said not only that, he said after that, James was the only one that didn't get to see him at that point. Showed himself to James. Last of all, he said, after he ascended into glory. He showed himself to me. And he tells him in verse 10. By the grace of God I am what I am. Now I need y'all to know today. By the grace of God you are who you are. It's by the grace of God that I am who I am. The Lord has been good to us. He's been good to me. It's not about silver and gold. Peter and James, Peter and John told the man in front of the pool of Bethesda, he said, of silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, what I got is something better. Got something better than silver and gold. I've got a work for you. I've got a promise for you. I've got the expectation that Jesus has done exactly what he said he would do. And now our eternity is complete. It is something worth living for. Don't live your few years on this earth as if nothing is coming after you die. We live to live again. And life is worth living because he lives. And so the Lord is saying unto them, you have to be careful, Paul is telling them. He said in verse 11, he said, uh, uh, therefore, therefore, after he got finished excoriating them, he said, therefore, uh, whether it were I or some 
somebody else, we preached this to you. Yes. Aquila preached this to you. Priscilla preached this to you. You heard it from Timothy and Silas. You heard it from me. We came in personal demonstration and we preached this to you. And he said, and you believed it then. Why don't you believe it now? You believed it then. Peter told the Galatians, Paul told the Galatians, he said, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you no longer believe the truth? We've got to, we've got to face that in the world today. We have to face that in America today. We have to face that in our own individual communities on today. Ye did run well. You ran well for a while, church, yes. in America. Yes. You ran well for a while, America. God bought black America. We ran well for a while. God bought us from the slave ship. From the slave house to the white house. We're still running around like we've not gained or accomplished any ground. The corruption and, and a lot of the oppression we see today. I want to tell somebody something. It's not about race. It's about power. Amen. People want you to think your greatest enemy is the black man or the white man. Your greatest enemy today is Government, bureaucrats, and those that are in power that want to keep you deceived. I'm trying to help somebody. You can't believe in this teaching Paul is telling them that you're hearing from the Sadducees. Paul said, I taught you better than this. How can you now be confused? Moses wrote that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Did he not, had he not, had he said it? And shall he not do it? Or had he spoken? And shall it not make it good? On this day that we recognize is the resurrection. Somebody's getting this. He rose again. What other proof do you need? Amen. The Lord has made a way out of no way. Yes. What other proof do you need? I'm telling you now, we have to recognize that the promises of God are good. And we've learned it. Then God puts us in places of leadership and responsibility to be accountable for the good news of the gospel. And what do we do? Well, let me give you an example. I'm getting ready to preach. <clears throat> let me give you an example of what we do. On Friday, I'm not giving no glory to the devil, but God says, I want you to be aware of the devices of the devil. He said, I don't want you to be deceived. He said, I'll make all things known to you. On Friday, March the 29th, the president of this country, Joe Biden, signed a declaration making effective immediately that on March the 31st, today, Resurrection Day, the day that the Christian world observes the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter for some folks. He wrote a declaration declaring March the 31st as, na as a national day of recognition for the LBGTQ community. A day, a national day of recognition. In the declaration, he signed, I declare this, this day, March the 29th, which was Friday, declaring March 31st, which is the day we are observing the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He declared that this day 
shall be a national day of recognition for the LBGTQ. Somebody, I'm telling you, church. I'm telling you, this is a dangerous time in American history. And if you are churches around this country that would elevate this damnable observance on the same day that we celebrate the greatest victory in the history of mankind, I want you to know that you're not saved. If you are a Christian and you lift this up as something that you will have uh, that overshadows the resurrection and the life of not only our Lord, but all of us. Jesus is the resurrection and the life of us all. How is, and then the timing of this is no coincidence. You could have declared this that day any time in the year. But you do it on Good Friday. You do it on the Friday marking the, the very Sunday that we recognize, the Christian church recognizes the most important day in the life of a human being because we're all born in sin and need to be saved. The timing of this is no coincidence. And he did it, I'm going to tell you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. He did it in the name of power and politics. He's not doing well in the polls. He needs this reprobate community to support him. Anything that they can get to grab on to to guarantee them power in November. They've done that. But I'm telling you, it's a dangerous thing that you've done, Mr. President. And all of those around you that supported this, allowed this, you've got the NAACP, you've got the Black Congressional Caucus, you got all these churches, black and white, that, that, that you entertain and entertain you all the time. And those churches sat by and allowed you to do this. You could have done this last month. You could have done this six months ago. But he did it at a time that he thought was a strategic move in a political campaign. I tell you what, this was the, probably the smartest campaign strategy you could have ever done, you and your campaign, uh, for your opponent. You probably just lifted your opponent up, whoever that opponent might be. We don't know. But this is not something you want to do with God. I'm trying to help somebody. The president of the White House would have never done this on Ramadan. They would have never done this to the Muslim community. Only the Christian church has to endure this kind of thing. If you're a Christian church and you're politically aligned with this White House and you raise a rainbow flag in your church or around your church property, you are not saved. If you would fly the rainbow flag in or around your church any day of the week, you are probably not saved. You can't promote something that is completely against God for expediency. I'm sorry, I'll preach to an empty church. Not going to do it because my reward, help me somebody, my reward now is in Jesus. Paul tells them in verse 12, he says, you know you got to recognize something. I want to tell you something that you ought to know. Keep this in mind, he said, for if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how can some among you say that there is no resurrection 
from the dead. You're listening to some bad thinking. You're listening to people that you are thinking they impress you with their stature. They've impressed you with the size of their church. They've impressed you with their with their excellent use of vocabulary. They've impressed you with their prestige that they have in the community. But Paul is saying you're listening to that and you're not keeping your eyes on God. He's given us the word. The Lord says, um, David said, Lord, I'm going to hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jesus said, I'm going to send you the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's going to bring all things back to your remembrance. When you need it, the Lord says he's going to drop it down in you. But you got to stay with the God of the Bible and the teaching that God has given you. And Paul says unto them, he says, how can you not believe? I want you to know, he says, if there is no resurrection, from the dead. He said that Jesus is still in the ground. If there is no resurrection, then where is his body? If there is no resurrection, who was it that everybody saw? He said if there was no resurrection, if you say and if you believe that Jesus didn't raise up from the dead, he said that Christ he is not risen. He said, and if Christ be not risen, he said, then our preaching is in vain. When you call on the name of the Lord from the pulpit, when we call on Jesus to heal the sick, we call on Jesus to deliver in a time of distress. We call on Jesus when we were at our wits end. And Jesus delivered for you. But Paul is saying, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our preaching is useless. It has not been effective. It was not even true. Paul said it that. He said, not only that, he said, but your faith is in vain. Your faith is useless. You trust it in the Lord. Don't say, I called on the Lord, and he answered me. Your faith, he said, don't say, I looked over yonder, and I see the Lord give me a message. The Lord tugged my heart one day. The Lord told me, don't quit, young man. Don't quit, young woman. Keep on running. The Lord told you when you were about to commit suicide and he stopped you from doing it. And now you're testifying about it. The Lord told you and the doctor told you that you wouldn't walk. You wouldn't have children. The Lord said, not so. But Paul is saying, and you gave God the glory. But if you go back on that thinking now, if you start supporting the talk that you're hearing on TV, you start hearing the talk from the false preachers and the false churches. Paul said, if you're giving glory to God, then your glory and your faith was in vain. Help me somebody. He said, if Christ be not risen, he said, but you, you, verse 15, he said, and, and, and we found false witnesses of God because you testified of God that when the Lord raised up Christ, you said, God fixed my cancer. God fixed my life. The Lord brought me out. Filled me with the Holy Ghost. I asked the Lord. I sought the Lord. And he heard me. And he filled me. He healed me. He cured me. Of all of my fears. How many testimonies have we heard. About people that was in looking in death's face. Standing at death's door. You are a walking miracle. But Paul said 
to them. He said, if Christ be not risen up from the dead, he said, then we are bound to be false witnesses. He said, you're telling something that's not true. If you believe that the Lord healed you, and now on the day, you want to judge, you want to question the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, you are witness. Your witness is false. You're a false preacher. You've got all these preachers standing in the pulpit, promoting same-sex marriage, standing in the pulpit. There is no justice in the land. Standing in the courthouse, there is no solution for the people. The country is going deeper and deeper into monetary poverty. Our borders are collapsed. We've got enemies that can wipe us out. When we are saying, God, I know that you are there and you're going to deliver. But Paul is saying, if Jesus didn't raise up from the dead, that witness you've been doing, it is false because the Lord is not risen. Now, help me somebody. He said, and if God raised not Jesus up from the dead, and if he didn't do that, if Jesus didn't do that, then Jesus is still, according to 16 and 17, I mean, 15 and 16, he said, if Jesus is not raised up, then your deliverance, it hasn't come. If Jesus is not raised up, there is no glory for you in the future. If Jesus is not raised up, there is no eternity with God. If Jesus is not raised up, he said to them, there is something very wrong in your salvation. But he wants you to know that if Jesus is not raised up from the dead, according to 1 Corinthians 1, 5, 15 and 17, if Jesus is not raised up from the dead, then you and me and all of us, Moses, the Father sent the twelve apostles, your mama that loved the Lord all her life, your daddy that lived for Jesus and God worked mightily in his life if Jesus did not raise up from the dead. If he is not raised up from the dead, then they are still in their sin and they are not in heaven. They are in hell. Their bodies is in hell. That if Jesus uh, is not raised from the dead, he said that we are still in our sleep. Verse 18, and everybody that's died believing in God, their bodies are still in the grave. And they are not coming out. Help me somebody. But the Bible declares uh, in verse 24, he said, but Jesus, he said, Jesus, the end cometh when he shall be delivered up to God. And that's already happened now. I've got to close. He's already been raised up. He was raised up to the kingdom of God, even our Father. And he has put down all power. For the Lord has given him all power in his hands. He said, Jesus, you are the last enemy. You are the first and the last enemy, Jesus, of sin. And sin and death is the last enemy of Jesus. Verse 26, he said, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And when the Lord rose up on the third day, having all power in his hand, the Lord says that they, death and hell, eternity, it belongs to him. The people had concerned about their loved ones too. Paul wrote to them in verse 35. Some men would say, how are the dead raised up? 
And what and with what body do they come? I'm going to end here right when I preach. You know what happens with a lot of church folks? People in general, they not they tend to not trust what they don't understand. If they don't understand something, they will dismiss it. It's like the parable of the seed. The Bible said that the seed that fell on the thorny ground. See, when they heard it, they received it. But the enemy came. The cares of the world came. The challenge of your faith came. And the Bible said it took the word right out of your mouth. You got to hold on to that that we believe. You don't understand the resurrection of the body. You do understand this. Jesus said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So if we're going to heaven to be with Jesus, we're going first in our spiritual body. He said, and later on, I'm going to give you a resurrected body. I'm going to give you, your, I'm going to take that which is corruptible and give you something that is incorruptible. You don't have to understand it. You just got to believe on Jesus and the work that he done. I don't understand a lot of things, but I heard the Bible say, the Lord will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to naught the understanding of the prudent. You don't have to believe on the philosophers and the geniuses, the moon readers and the star readers. The Lord says that you need to believe on him. He said to them, Thou fool, in verse 36, he said, That which is soweth is not quickened except he die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain that the chance of wheat or of some other grain, what God is saying unto them. He said, you, you're looking in the natural, but you got to look in the supernatural. And he explained it to them in a way that they would understand, you see. They understood farming. They understood husbandry. So he uses an example that they would understand. He said, when you put that seed in the ground, before that seed can grow, he says, it first got to die, just like us. Before you go and be with Jesus, you've got to put this seed called life. It's got to die in the ground. And in order for it to grow back into something else, that seed that you see that you put in the ground is not the same observation, the same thing you saw when it raised up again. You put a black seed in the ground, but what you got up out of the ground was a green watermelon. So the Lord is saying in the same vein, he said, we got to give up this body, if we expect to live a, 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 an eternal life with God, you can't take this body with you. I tell believers all the time, if you don't stand, if you don't understand the millennium reign, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, then don't worry about it. All you got to believe and understand is that you leave this world, you leave this body believing in Jesus, that Jesus is Lord. Don't put anything before your Lord. Don't let the dogs of the love of this world steal your joy. Don't eat from the devil's table. Then expect that the Lord is going to bring you up. You got to believe in Jesus. Above all other things, you got to believe on Jesus. Before you believe on money, look around the world. Everybody's craving money, more money than they need. The Bible says, 
sin is pleasurable for a season, but there's going to come a time, payday some way, someday, payday is coming after a while, so I'm going to believe on Jesus. I believe that the thief cometh, but to kill, steal, and destroy, but the Lord Jesus, he has come that we might have life, eternal life, and that we might have it on the earth more abundantly. We've got to believe on Jesus. He said, how be it that that was not the first that was spiritual. He says in verse 36, I got to stop. In verse 46, he says, how be it that that what that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, it is spiritual. He said, first man was of the earth, he was earthly. Second man was of heaven. You've got to shed this flesh and blood. He said, is your first natural? But now it's going to be spiritual. We've been born again of the spirit. We were once carnal. Now we're spiritual. You've got to trust God in all your ways. He said, brethren, I'm going to show you a mystery. You may not understand, but just believe by faith. He said, we shall not always sleep. Glory be to God. But the Lord is going to turn the corruptible into the incorruptible. And he's going to do it because he rose up from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures with all power in his hand, with our eternity in his hand. He can affect things in this world if he wants to. But just know that God is never not in control. No matter what you see going on, don't cast all of your, 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 your faith in what you see man doing. Don't be a Democrat and miss heaven. Don't be a Republican and miss heaven. Don't be rich and miss heaven. Don't be accepted by people and miss heaven. Don't fall into an abominable lifestyle. In this heaven, the Lord is not going to accept the excuse. Bible says, come to Jesus. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor in a heavy laden. And he said, I'll give you rest. Satan can't give you rest. Donald Trump can't give you rest. Joe Biden can't give you rest. Homeland Security can't give you rest. You see that. The courts can't give you rest. The banks can't give you rest, won't give you rest. Your friends, they can't give you rest. Your wife and you or your husband cannot give you rest. Children, young and old, your parents can't give you rest. The only one that can give us rest is Jesus because when he rose up from the dead, he said a great and wonderful thing in 1 Corinthians 15 and 55. He said, oh, death, where is your sting? He said, oh, brave, where is your victory? If I leave this body, I'm going to go on and be with the Lord. I'm like Martin Luther King. I'm not afraid of death anymore. If you got your mind right and your heart and your relationship is right with Jesus, you don't have to fear death anymore. I wake up every morning and I look at this old body in the mirror and every day it's changing. But I am not disillusioned. I am not saddened. It's the progression of things. It's the way God designed it to be. But one of these old days, I heard the songwriter say, one of these old mornings, and it's going to happen soon. He said, one of these old mornings, 
I'm going to be gone. But I believe what the Bible says. God had a son. And they called him Jesus. He came to live. Heal and provide. But the Bible went on to say. But he went. He went into the grave. And he bare my burdens. And because he did. The Lord says. He lives. And I. I can face tomorrow. I can face the burdens of the day. I can face the problems that come. I can face hardship in this body because my Savior lives. And He lives. He rose from the dead. He is risen. And He lives. To God be the glory. God is going to bring us out. You got to trust God. There is plenty of testimony in the Bible. The Bible says in the days of Noah, in the days of Sodom, in the days of the kings, he said men was just living and marrying and going about their merry old way. Our separation from God has resulted in the dissipation. I used that word earlier. The dissipation of Corinth. Because we rebelled against the Bible. That same dissipation has come into our society. God intended marriage. God intended children to have a mother and a father. God intended the man to be the burden bearer in the family. God intended the woman to be the helpmeet of the man, however that's defined in their home. God intended the parents, the father, to be an example to the children, the mother to be an example to the children. God intended for the family to be intact. God intended for for, for he told the, the Levites that he warned them against unjust weights. God said we ought to be men in business. We ought to be judging people according to God's law. We ought to be fair. We ought to be, we ought to show an equal love, not equity. Now where in the Bible does God talk about diversity equity and inclusion. Matter of fact, God is an exclusive God. He said separate good from evil. But the world, even the church now, is calling evil good. God is not pleased with that. And we will not survive as individuals. We will not survive as a nation, if we rebel against our God for whatever your reason might be, there was nothing more horrific in history than slavery, the Holocaust, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, nothing more horrific than those events. But it was God that delivered us. The Germans didn't turn around and say, okay, we made a mistake. Let's let the Jews go. God overcame them. The slave masters all around the world, they didn't wake up one day and just say, slavery is wrong. The strong arm of God delivered those nations to turn them to God. The slave masters in America, black and white, white and black, they didn't wake up one day and decide, you know, slavery is wrong. No, the strong arm of God delivered this nation. God made us a world power. 1929, we were in economic duress. We had a national bankruptcy. 
They called it the Great Depression. 1929. By 1939, America was experimenting with the atom bomb. By 1947, America was the world premier military and economic capital of the world. God did that. Now we are watching it piece by piece being taken away. Why? We were a nation that believed God coming in. The pilgrims believed God. The slaves coming in, we believed God. But oh, 2024, we don't need God no more. We're going to worship the temple of idols. Whatever that idol might be in your life. But what I say is come to Jesus. Come to Jesus right now. The Lord is not mocked. Whatsoever God promised, he is also going to deliver. He's going to do what he said. Receive him, be saved. Reject him, be damned. He has given us that choice. Father, we thank you today for a mighty, 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 mighty word. And we believe on you, Lord. And we trust you. By faith we believe you. And by faith we trust you. And Lord we ask forgiveness. As a nation. We ask forgiveness as individuals. That you will have mercy on us. That your wrath will not be so severe. That we are not able to survive. But Lord, we know even in that, you know how to deliver the righteous in the midst of the wicked. So have mercy on us, O oh God. Save them that would be saved. Deliver the backslider. Redeem the downtrodden, O oh God, the sick and the shedding. Lord, we ask that you hear our prayer and our praise. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night. For our Wednesday night Bible study. Right here at City Refuge Christian Center. Church of God in Christ. You have a very blessed Resurrection Sunday observation. And remember, Jesus is Lord. No matter what you're going through, folks, remember, there is still a God. People are living horrific existences. And sometimes it's easy for them to say, where is God? But there are many, many, many more testimonies that when people made that cry, the Lord answered. God be blessed.